Linda Burney, welcome to the program. Thanks, David. So you've listed four priority areas you'd like The Voice to focus on, but won't it be up to The Voice to decide for itself what it wants to pursue? The priority areas that I've identified are health, housing, jobs, and of course, um, and of course, housing. The really important, oh, sorry, education. Mm. The really important thing to understand is that I have been involved in Aboriginal affairs for 44 years. I've travelled this country extensively, and they are the persistent issues that are raised with me. The relationship that I want with The Voice is a two-way process, David, one of respect, uh, one of listening to fresh ideas about intractable problems. The issues around, uh, obviously, baby birth weights, the issues around life expectancy, of course, are important. But let's look at the uh, community development program. It's a jobs program. It's affecting a 1,000 communities. Uh, and it is failing. It is absolutely failing. And not one size fits all 1,000 communities. Those are the points I was making. Mm. I'm just trying to get a sense uh, for the viewers of how this works if The Voice gets up at the referendum. Would you as Minister be advising The Voice on what they should be advising you on? Uh, the Voice is about two things. It's about making a practical difference to the shocking social justice outcomes for Aboriginal people. And of course, it's about that wonderful unifying aspect of recognising 65,000 years of truth, of story, of history in our constitution. David, I was 10 years old in 1967 when uh, we were counted after a successful referendum and the Commonwealth got the responsibility for Aboriginal affairs. So this is... Uh, this is something that's come from Aboriginal people. It is something that Aboriginal people have been asking for from as far back as the 1930s. The relationship will be one, as I said, based on trust, based on a two-way process. And I can assure people watching us this morning uh, that the issues that The Voice will be focused on are issues that worry, worry people watching this show, the disparity, uh, and that's what we're going to be focusing on. But by setting these priorities, are you indicating this is where you might legislate the voice should or shouldn't um, uh, go? Would you put these sort of priorities, health, education, housing, jobs, into legislation as to what you'd like the voice to do? Uh, the point that I made just previously, it will be a two-way process. Uh, it will be something based on trust. Um, and I have held in the past uh, a position in an, in an advocacy body and know how important it is to work collaboratively uh, with the government to raise issues with the government that the government needs to hear. But remember, this voice is not just about advising the government. It's also about advising the parliament. So if there's legislation, for example, coming through the parliament that directly affects Aboriginal people, the parliament could seek the views of the voice. Uh, there is nothing to lose from this proposal, but there is so much to gain. Just on this legislation question, though, you'll have to legislate the voice after the referendum if it gets up. Would that include yes. the, the, the remit of the voice, the areas that it can and can't cover? Uh, the legislation that you're referring to, particularly for our viewers this morning, is after the referendum, mm. which will be asking you uh, to, uh, to protect a voice in the Constitution mm. so it cannot be gotten rid of by the stroke of a pen. The legislation that will follow this will determine the composition of the voice, 
the functions of the voice, um, and, and ultimately the establishment of the voice. What about That's the scope, the though? I'm just asking, whether, would it be the scope as well of the areas, the issues that it can cover? The, the, the way that I, I see it as the Minister, David, is that that scope should be a respectful discussion with the voice. I have identified very clearly what, what, what I have identified very clearly what I think the priorities are. But obviously there are there are other mm. issues like baby birth weights, uh, like life expectancy. Okay. But I just really say to you very clearly. There is nothing to lose and there is everything to gain from the establishment okay. of the voice. But just to be clear on this two-way process you're talking about, you'd, you'd talk to the voice, they'd talk to you, but you're not going to legislate what they can and can't um, advise on. Uh, the voice is an independent body uh, chosen by Aboriginal people uh, to represent their, their views and their voices in Canberra. And I will respect that independence. Um, look, you, you mentioned uh, some of the issues that you uh, believe The Voice will be interested in providing advice. And you gave a couple of practical examples too during the week at the Press Club, um, in improving school attendance in remote communities, uh, fixing the community development program you mentioned there on the jobs front, birthing on country. Uh, just give us a sense of how that works. So if The Voice were to come to you as Minister and say, we need more funding to encourage more birthing on country, what happens? Uh, well, a fantastic example of this is a place called Waminda in Nara that are in the process of developing a birthing on country program. But the way that it practically works, uh, David, is that we know that this is successful. When doctors listen to patients, they get better outcomes. When bosses listen to workers, they better outcomes. When policy makers listen to Aboriginal people, they get better outcomes. And we know that where birthing on country has been in place, that there has been a, a halving of, uh, of early, early deliveries, in fact, premature babies, in other words. It means involving culture. It means involving language. It means in involving the extended family. It is a very different way of doing business and it makes, uh, it makes sure that Aboriginal women having babies are seeing uh, their Aboriginal midwife earlier and sooner and more often during pregnancies. And it's a two-way process also. It means that those institutions that deliver babies become more familiar with uh, the Aboriginal women that they're working with and can take into a consideration things like uh, when a baby's born in the Aboriginal community, certain procedures, certain, uh, certain cultural aspects are taken care of. That's a practical example. But think about this, David, that in the education space, there is at least a three, one to three year gap with young children in literacy and numeracy. And that gap gets wider mm -hmm. as that young person gets older. And we had, we had just last year only 57% of Aboriginal children or young people finishing high school and over 80% of, uh, of the rest of the community. That is a gap that I would expect The Voice to be able to advise okay, on, the process on how here, we close the, that gap. Just the process here, would, would you as Minister put more weight on advice from The Voice than advice from your own department? Uh, look, the, that is a hypothetical, but thank you for it. Um, obviously, you listen to your own department. But the way in which we're looking at Aboriginal affairs uh, under... Anthony Albanese, Albanese's leadership is the way that it should be, that Jason Clare is responsible for mm. education. So I'd be speaking with uh, Jason Clare and he'd be getting advice, but obviously yeah, no, understandably, we'd be but, seeking but on, advice from The Voice. OK, but on something like birthing on country uh, or the jobs issues you're talking about, if The Voice says one thing and your department says another, what do you as Minister do? Uh, well, uh, I have 
enormous experience, as you know. Uh, I would be listening to, to both and, and trying to um, make sure that what, what goes forward mm. is what will work for Aboriginal young people in school. Uh, this is not complex. I mean, I am in um, Launceston today and will be uh, door knocking with Bridget Archer this afternoon. I'm speaking tomorrow afternoon with Peter Gutwin at the University of Tasmania. And it's about listening to people. It's about showing respect. Mm. And as I say, this is about bringing ideas forward that make a practical difference to the lives of Indigenous people. And everyone agrees that that needs to happen. You, you have said, you told Parliament the Voice won't be giving advice on changing Australia Day, but it could, couldn't it? The, I know Aboriginal Australia and I know that people know what the important issue is. Things like what I've identified, education, health, housing, jobs. And Josie Douglas, who is this remarkable Aboriginal woman uh, in the Central Land Council, put it perfectly. We are about changing lives, mm. not changing dates. I, I don't doubt that view is there, but it, it, can, it can provide advice on that issue, can't it? Uh, the voice I know will concentrate on issues to close the gap in this okay. country. David, we've got 19 targets and four are on track. That cannot be good for the mm. country and it's certainly not good for Aboriginal people. Uh, I want to get your thoughts on that ad that ran in the Financial Review during the week uh, from the No campaign. It depicted the West Farmers chairman, mm. um, Michael Cheney, handing a wad of cash to Yes campaigner Thomas Mayo. Uh, uh, Kate Cheney, the independent MP, sitting on the knee of her father. Was this a racist ad in your view? Uh, this was universally and appropriately criticised. Totally unacceptable. And I think Matt Keane, uh, the uh, Shadow Health Minister in New South Wales, really nailed it, David, where he likened it to um, a racist trope from the Jim Crow days in America. But it was also incredibly sexist uh, and uh, it is uh, something, in the words of Matt Keane, the no, the no Camp has every right to have a say, but there are better ways of doing it. Final one on The Voice. If the referendum fails later this year, will you still seek to legislate The Voice so it can do all of the good things you're talking about this morning? Uh, the focus of myself and the government is absolutely on a successful referendum. It's why I'm down here in Tasmania. It's why I'm heading over to Western Australia on Monday night, going to Albany, Port Hedland and Kununurra. Uh, there, will be, there will be, in my view, uh, and I've, I've said this many times, I have enormous faith in the Australian people. And I don't say that because I'm supposed to say it. I say it because I really believe it. And I believe that this will be a successful referendum. OK, but if not, will you still legislate it? It will be a successful okay. referendum. <laughs> Just finally, uh, Linda Burney on robo-debt um, and the Royal Commission report. As, as the report notes, you as Shadow Minister uh, for Human mm. Services wrote to Alan Tudge, this was way back in 2016, uh, raising concerns, asking for the debt recovery action to be paused. It wasn't. Knowing what we know now, do you think there should be further consequences for the former ministers involved? I think there has to be consequences uh, for people involved. Like what? Uh, I, do, I don't know what's in the sealed section. Uh, but what I do know, David, is this, is that Labor had been raising these issues as far back as 2016. Uh, the Commissioner has said that this was cruel, it was unlawful, and it made innocent people feel like criminals. Um, and I spoke to so many people 
when I was the Shadow Minister for Human Services, we knew the algorithm was unjust and unfair and that there was no human involvement in it. Uh, this is a shocking indictment of, uh, of it not being uh, stopped uh, and it just, mm. it just says to me there has to be consequences. I can't articulate exactly uh, what they should be because I don't know what's in this seal section, mm. but the brave people that came forward uh, over this issue I just say thank you. All right. Linda Burney, we'll have to leave it there. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, David.